Sue, Paulina Wolf, uh, Molly McInerney, Aisha Guvenelier, and also our AV um, person, Tim, who at the back, who's making this hybrid event possible. So thank you, everyone. So I also want to acknowledge senior leaders who um, uh, support this uh, program, Provost Cindy Barnhart and the Institute of Community Equity Officer, John Dozier. We also um, have colleagues joining us from Lincoln Lab. Welcome. Um, I want to acknowledge um, Professor Drake's um, faculty host who's here, um, Professor Fakili Bruchette, and um, a contingency from chem chemi, chemical engineering colleagues right here in this table. So welcome. Thank you for joining us and also uh, throughout the room. Um, I also want to acknowledge your scholars um, who are our other current MLK um, visiting scholars joining us this cohort. We have Brandon Ogbunu, Eunice Ferreira, Daniel Auguste, Wasilu Jaco, Louis Masai, and Brian Nord. And I know many of them are joining us virtually. So welcome. Um, note that this um, uh, session will be recorded. So a friendly reminder to please stay muted um, during the presentation. Live captioning is available. And about 1250, we'll have time for Q&A. Um, and we will be monitoring the chat um, function too for those who have any questions or comments um, for those joining us via Zoom. Um, subscribe to our newsletter at ico.mit.edu if you'd like to hear more about um, our events and future presentations. Our next event, just to keep folks in mind, it's on Wednesday, April 5th, and that's with um, Louis Messiah, our other MLK scholar. And he's actually the last MLK scholar to be presenting this spring semester. So just to keep that in mind um, about our presenter. So um, Professor Javid Drake from the Department of Chemical Engineering is an MLK visiting scholar 2022 to 2023. He is an inventor, researcher, lecturer, and consultant in batteries, fuel cells, and transport in chemical systems. Until 2022, he was a principal scientist and a senior technical leader at Procter & Gamble, where he led and individually contributed to R&D projects and recruiting efforts for nearly 20 years in parallel in for nearly 20 years in parallel with lectureship at MIT since 2010. The journey has provided him experience in teaching students in academia and employees within the commercial sector to bring ideas to practical use in society. In addition, he has identified and developed top diverse innovator talent. I will pass the virtual mic now to Professor Javid Drake. Okay, are we going on audio? Very good. Okay, so we'll get started. We have charged times. We are in an unprecedented time of adoption of battery and clean energy technology for our vehicles, for our homes and storing the excess energy from the grid and from renewable sources. Charged times, charged times also is polarized times. We have many of us who recognize that climate change is real and is happening and that humans activity, including the use of fossil fuels is contributing to that. Yet at the same time, on the other end, we have naysayers who actually either don't believe climate change is happening, don't believe that human activity is the cause, or may have financial or economic or other incentives not to make any changes. Charged times with this uh, battery research, this will potentially affect, if successful, um, and as well as other technologies, can affect up to 8 billion people on the planet, okay? Because that's what we have to, to have, have uh, that's what we're supporting here. And offer a significant economic prosperity potential to those who actually will be involved in the invention and the discovery and the development of companies that will actually enable this to happen. So we are charged and amped up. A little shout out to Martin Luther King, who of course lived in charged times, um, after whom this, uh, this position, which I'm um, delighted and honored to, be, to have is, is named. Um, he lived in charged times and was responsible for many of the changes that enable um, and many black and, and brown and other people to have advances in their life and in their career. So charged times, what is the draw for doing battery research and teaching, I will add, using chemical engineering? So I'll talk about this. I'll talk a little bit about my journey up front, uh, what sort of 
are there other things that draw me to this? And hopefully some of this you can relate to. Um, and some of these maybe you may build upon in the kind of final minutes when we have some time to discuss. So I'll talk about my personal path and I'll talk a little bit more about the research and, and some of the teaching and, and, and a little bit of how, how batteries work. Now, I will say in advance that I will simplify things considerably. So those of you in the field may uh, sort of, you know, there, there'll be opportunity for deeper discussion either at the end or, or afterwards, feel free to contact me. So I will be simplifying things. And we'll also be talking about batteries to sort of represent a whole class of systems, including fuel cells and maybe some electrolysis. So but I'm using the word battery sort of to simplify things, okay? So just, uh, just, uh, just bear with me on that. So, but first, as I mentioned, I'll talk about my personal path. And um, I had a, uh, a personal path that was really fostered curiosity and passion. So I um, it was, it was, a, was a curious uh, child, okay? I was interested in how things work, even as my mother will recall, uh, if I'll, I'll get to his, uh, you know, recall, I was, I was interested in locks and bikes and all kinds of things, just little things, how they worked, right? Okay, so I was very curious. Um, and I was quite passionate. I loved uh, math, as many people in this uh, MIT world can probably relate to. It was my first love was math. Um, I started liking science once I realized you could use math to solve scientific problems and, and make practical uh, and meaningful solutions to things. So that was really my, my, my early sort of memories of being curious and, and passionate about math. Um, this was fostered. Fortunately, I had a loving home. Um, I had a you know, uh, sister and an older brother that I grew up with um, and a wonderful, loving uh, a superwoman as a single, uh, single mother who, uh, just an example, she actually has ongoing curiosity and passion and is really a role model for me, um, Kathleen Glover. And just an example of her curiosity and passion, she uh, self-elected to do the prerequisites for going to medical school, completed medical school while raising three children on her own, okay? So I saw firsthand as a teenager, my mother graduated from medical school, okay? So I got a firsthand view of what it took to get an advanced degree and what curiosity and passion were all about, okay? So that curiosity and passion took me here to MIT. So I have this, this brass ring, this uh, ring here. Um, so I was course 10, so that's chemical engineering for those who are listening and maybe not in the MIT community. So um, I did uh, chemical engineering, lived in Newhouse, uh, and, and uh, you know, did the same commute that many of you are, are doing uh, here from, uh, you know, from the dorms to, to campus. Now, chemical engineering was a great foundation, as I'll mention, with some of the principles of how batteries work um, for learning about, the, learning about batteries and, and sort of satisfying that curiosity. I had a wonderful time here at MIT. If there are any undergrads in the audience who are not having a great time, I'd be glad to talk with you about how to make that happen because I had a wonderful time here, did many, uh, you know, did sports and varsity track and, and music and symphony orchestra and concert band and five to 10 intramurals per year. So really had a tremendous time uh, living, the, living the full MIT experience. Not to say that it was easy, right? Okay, so, so it, was, it was easy. And that set me up well to go to graduate school at the University of California, Berkeley, where I re began to really learn about electric chemical science and engineering. Um, under the, the advisorship of, of John Newman and uh, Clay Radke, two professors uh, uh, who were really luminaries in electrochemical engineering as well as interfacial science. So um, then my journey took me to, with that understanding and recognizing, wow, this, this is not only a, a, a field that's, that's fascinating scientifically, we can actually make a difference here. Um, and, uh, and so I began to, and I moved to Boston area and kind of reconnected to the, you know, to the MIT community um, and sort of the, that takes us more to the present. I met my wonderful wife a year, after, a year later, and sort of this is sort of my, my life these days, right? <laughs> the family, the travels, and, and a little bit of music still, okay? So I sort of talked about my, my background, my sort of curious uh, curiosity and, and the passion behind it. Uh, and I'll um, talk about, uh, you know, these three elements um, as sort of key. Um, there's, a, there's a book that I sometimes, um, that I look at and I've read and I sometimes look back at, it's called Serial Innovators. I don't have it posted here, but it actually talks about how curiosity is a key element for innovation. Um, this ongoing curiosity, wanting to know how and why things apart, uh, how, how and why things work, taking things apart, uh, probing things, interrogating things um, in a way that's actually not required as part of someone's job, but it's an ongoing curiosity and passion in terms of determination. Um, and having a drive to actually help help society. So, um, so I'll first talk about mission, okay? And this is something that we may all share and 
And uh, so I invite you to all share, hopefully we all relate to. And that mission, big mission behind uh, this and, and what is the draw for battery research for me is about, it's about climate change. And of course, uh, you know, with, with uh, thanks and, and credit to the graduate students who helped uh, prepare these slides, uh, some of these slides, um, the, uh, you know, we have a, we have a, a climate change issue as, as many of you are well aware. Um, you know, we're expecting by the end of the century to have a, you know, a three to four degrees Celsius, that's, you know, six degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. Um, uh, and this is several degrees, so we might not notice this, uh, you know, tremendously, but we also have to recognize that um, this will come with extremes in weather, right? And we all recognize this. Um, so there will be extremes in weather that have already, they're already happening. The other thing is that obviously the polar ice caps with a few degree difference makes a huge difference, okay? As far as the mass of, of, uh, of, of ice that is responsible and, and affects the global climate um, in terms of the wildlife and, and, and really actually affects us all. So this is a big difference. Um, this is the amount of CO2 emissions, um, for by say gigaton of emissions in the US and uh, annually. So this is a tremendous amount of, of CO2 that's emitted as, as a result of human activity. Um, you can see that the, you know, the areas that, that the batteries might affect, um, and I'm lumping batteries and electrolysis and other things as well, um, might, might actually uh, mitigate and, and address some of the, and mess a significant amount of this. But top two, sort of the transportation and electric power generation and electric storage, um, there's commercial and residential. So if we can actually apply um, battery technology in these different areas, um, anything from you know, some sort of micro, you know, about micro transport to actual vehicles and larger scale things, electric power and the ability to harness uh, wind and photovoltaic energy and, and, uh, and actually store that energy, and redeploy that to homes uh, in the commercial or, or, or built or other types okay, of building bye, bye. Um, when needed. Um, we think about the in the agriculture area, of course, there are transportation needs there. So lithium ion battery is one example, but also other electric chemical technologies are our are, are driver for actually um, are, are, excuse me, are a, an opportunity, have an opportunity to affect um, all pieces of this of this pie here. Okay. So um, so with this, um, I'm going to skip the next slide to make sure we we uh, we move things along. But um, I'll skip this slide. So what are the limitations? Okay, so we have motivated by um, by this climate change issue, um, but these uh, but meeting these these application needs will will, uh, will will call for a combined power power high power and high energy, and so these applications call for high sustained rate as well as uh, and they will necessitate. Uh, advancements in battery technology, because if we think about you know these uh, you know some of these applications right where you're taking in you know so surges of availability from from the grid or from renewable sources, um, uh, you have aggressive sort of needs in terms of transportation. And think about aviation where you simply do not want the power to give out. Right? Who wants to be on a plane where the power gives out? Oh, sorry, we're out. Okay, it's one thing if it's your cell phone, but if you're on an airplane, okay, you do not want that to happen. Okay, so if these these are have are very demanding applications. That, that actually call for sustained high power, which is a space that hasn't been really been, been met by current applications. And so um, for those of you, we have an audience that's in various fields. We have uh, many chemical engineers, but we have people in various fields. So I'll, just, I'll, break, I'll describe this a little bit. So the power axis is about, you know, uh, enables things like fast charging, okay? Addressing that sort of surge in availability, say from the, you know, from excess wind and, and photovoltaic sources. Grid excess, okay? When you suddenly have availability, you need to take that into the, into the battery system. Acceleration, of course, right? Uphill climbing and thrust, so, okay? So you're taking off, so an aircraft is taking off, okay? High power demands, okay? The horizontal axis is about being able to charge, not only quickly, but being able to charge fully, okay? Longer driving range, longer run time. So that's really the energy, this energy axis, okay? And so um, one of the plots that's used a lot in, in, in battery and energy technology is, is this plot. And this is the overlay of, of difference uh, across the power axis and uh, put in per mass, which matters, okay, and the energy, uh, energy axis, sort of specific energy axis. And you see that among different battery technologies, the state of the art is, is lithium ion, and it has come down a lot in price, which has enabled a lot of the use of electric, uh, batteries and electric vehicles and other applications, okay? So, but still, in order to meet the demands of these very, uh, very sort of aggressive applications, we need, this needs to get pushed out further. We need to go to that upper sort of, you know, right part um, where we have power that's actually sustained over long stretches of time. 
So we're not only getting fast charging, but we're also getting full charging, okay? So if you look at the electric vehicles, okay, many of them, many of them sort of report and sort of tout fast charging time. So, you know, even down to, you know, 30 minutes or 20 minutes and so forth, but you look at the fine print, you're not getting full charging, okay? So we're actually dealing with, we wanna actually have broader adoption of these technologies. We just have them sort of fit all lifestyles. Some people will need actually full charging and, and, uh, and fast charging, okay? So just looking at the fine print on that, or if they are getting a lot of, uh, or if they get, are getting a lot of, lot of range or a lot of range very quickly, um, check the price tag, okay? Because they may just be adding more batteries, right? And I put the per mass here to say, this is not a, a matter of just adding more batteries, right? Um, actually on a per mass basis, needs to deliver high power on a per mass basis, needs to deliver, needs to have a lot of energy, okay? So these are, these are sort of, you know, two key metrics that I'll talk about. I'll put this in a sort of also in further sort of common terms. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a track and field uh, you know, fan. I love, uh, I love track and field, so I'll put this in, in this context. So I think about, um, think about uh, high power sort of like is high rate, right? Think like Usain Bolt, right? Okay, right? High rate, right? A incredible amount of, incredible rate, right? But a short distance, right? Not particularly, and he's of course very fast, so it's a even shorter, distance, shorter time but not a, very, not a very long distance, okay? And we think about also here on the, on the horizontal axis, further out here, these, these ultra distance, uh, you know, uh, racers, right? That, that walk, you know, 50, 100, even longer miles, right? Incredible distances, right? But not very fast, okay? Okay? What we actually need is the ultra, is the elite marathoners, okay? They run fast, they run far, okay? <laughs> That's what we need, okay? All right, okay. That's what we need. We need the, we need the ultra, we need the, the lead marathoners of, of battery, <laughs> the battery technology, okay? All right, that's what we need. They run the distance from here to that door faster than like most people can run. Like, they, none of that, that distance of 26 miles, is, I want to say it differently. A distance of 26 miles or over 40 kilometers, they run that whole distance at a speed that's faster than most people can run any distance, right? You know, from here to that door or wherever, right? Okay, incredible sort of speed overall, that's what we need to, in order to, and the important thing is that we need this so that we get broader adoption, right? Okay, we cannot just have this be a niche, a niche application, okay? So these are, this is sort of breaking down some of the needs, okay? So where my curiosity leads me is, well, well, let's talk about how batteries work. So um, these are the needs and, and why can't we just have that tomorrow, okay? So, um, the combination of curiosity and passion led me to, you know, into my graduate studies and then later on how do batteries work and what are the limitations and what are some solutions that we can work on. And I'll talk about a highlight of work that, that we're currently, um, currently doing now. So um, how lithium ion battery works, and I'm gonna focus on particularly on the lithium ion itself within the system. And, um, and so, uh, so let's talk about lithium, okay? Lithium and it's hosted inside of a carbon material. Um, it typically in, in commercial lithium ion batteries. Um, and lithium is an element, if you're not familiar with, lithium very much wants to give away a, an electron. It's an element, it's a group one element in the periodic table. It really wants to give away an electron, right? Can't wait to do that, right? We actually, you know, there's another material that's an oxidant that really loves to accept electrons. It just can't, can't wait to accept an electron relative to lithium, can't wait to accept electrons, okay? Now, if we were to put these two materials in contact, they would react violently. It would give off, you know, certainly a lot of heat uh, and do actually, if we, as we know about when there are lithium ion battery fires, right? Give off a lot of heat, potentially sound, uh, potentially light if there's a flash, okay? They give off a tremendous amount of, of energy, right? If they're directly in physical contact, yeah? But what we do with an elegant sort of scientific and engineering trick is we have them transfer that electron around an external wire instead, okay? So that's basically how, you know, how, how a battery works, okay? Uh, and these materials love to react, love, the lithium loves to give away its electron, the metal compound loves to accept its electron so much that that electron is willing to fight through a light bulb, as, as I'm gonna show, it's willing to fight, to turn a motor, it's willing to go through your cell phone, it's willing to go through your, 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 your electric vehicle to get to the other side, okay? So it's willing to do, uh, uh, willing to do work, okay? in order to give up that electron from the lithium, which really wants, it's a hot potato. It can't wait to give it away. 
No one loves to catch potatoes, okay? All right, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and they love, they will put, they will knock down all kinds of barriers to do that, okay? To do that dance, okay? All right. Now, this desire, right, to actually, the strong desire to actually react in this way is chemical thermodynamics, right? It's, it's sort of, thermodynamics is kind of like inevitability, right? These things really want to react, okay? Or really have a lot of, we can release a lot of energy, okay? But we're allowing this to happen through an external wire, okay? The next uh, sort of, and these are sort of three pillars of chemical engineering, chemical thermodynamics, chemical reaction, and chemical transport. So the next step is that we close the switch, right? This is just a desire to react. When we close the switch, we allow that certain processes to happen. And I'll show them one by one, but in reality, they happen all simultaneously, okay? So the lithium becomes a lithium ion. It really loves that. It's delighted. Um, the electron actually moves around through the external wire, powering something, powering your phone, powering your light bulb, okay? It sort of reunites on the, inside the metal compound um, and carries out this second reaction here. This is a metal compound. This can be uh, metal oxides, metal phosphates, sulfates, or, or any of variety of compounds. Um, my material science friends can actually run off a list of dozens of, of possibilities, and we can run wild with them. Um, but when it makes its way, when it actually go, undergoes the transport part of things, it reacts again, and actually sort of from the, as far as the solution is concerned, that lithium ion disappears and becomes part of this, part of this metal compound, okay? Again, and I'm really highlighting, there's a lot of other things, a lot of the, uh, other, other processes involved as far as where the actual, um, you know, lithium atom goes and so forth, but I'm really highlighting the lithium ion because I'm gonna be focused on transport. Okay. So this is a nice little trick and I'll just show it again just because it was, you know, uh, it, was, it was sort of, it's always fun to uh, do this together. Also part of this talk and the purpose, uh, the thing I'm relaying in this talk is sort of, you know, the desire around teaching, right? So I love animation. This is part of my sort of style of, of, of teaching as well, okay? Generating a lithium ion, reacting, uh, moving to the other side with transport um, and, then, um, and then the other reaction happening, okay? So this is such a nice sort of elegant trick and so forth, but what could go wrong with it? What are the limitations, okay? Well, it gets a little bit more complicated because I drew this lithium ion as the charge, as the, as the sort of the charge carrier across this, uh, this, this battery, okay? But it's not quite the whole story, okay? Um, it turns out that there is uh, another species, uh, we call them species in, in uh, chemical science and engineering. So what in the world could limit this, this elegant story, okay? One of the limitations is that the lithium ions don't move easily enough, okay? So in a commercial lithium ion battery, the lithium doesn't carry all of the, all of the current inside the battery, it carries about one third of it. So if I have three lithiums that form lithium ions, okay, then, um, then that lithium that's, that's generated inside of this carbon electrode, um, it actually, so one in every three of the lithium, let's put it that way, is actually makes its way over to the positive electrode side. Okay, and what we see is instead that the negative ion, the anion, actually moves the other way. So most of the actual, the, the current that's carried inside the battery is actually carried by the anion, okay, in the commercial lithium ion batteries. So it carries just one third uh, of the ionic current the lithium does, okay? Now this causes an issue because um, as I've depicted, we actually need lithium on this, in this metal compound side of the, of the battery um, to actually carry out this reaction. And so what we end up with is a uh, lithium ion excess on this, in this negative carbon electrode and, and, uh, and lithium ion starved on this uh, metal compound um, side, of, a positive side of the battery, okay? And what that means is that this reaction has to work harder. And working harder means costing you energy and generating heat, okay? So this inhibits the starvation of lithium ions in here, inhibits the reaction and contributes to energy loss. Now this situation becomes worse with high power and high energy. And that's the connection I wanna to make to the application space we wanna to go to. The faster you actually try to drive this, all these processes, the worse the situation becomes. And you end up with this plot here on the right where you have lithium ion, uh, sort of a plot of lithium ion concentration versus position inside the battery. You have an excess inside of this negative electrode we sort of depicted here. Um, this is actually lithium ion starved on the positive electrode. And this is sort of, this is during discharge and active active use of the battery, okay? So this situation is problematic. This space that we actually know we need for to address, uh, you know, our critical demands um, creates a problem inside the battery. Another problem is overheating, 
Okay, and we're all well aware of this. Um, you know, I don't need to show you all the horror stories of batteries catching on fire, of which, of course, gasoline uh, power vehicles catch fire too, right? So we've all seen those, okay? But, um, but again, we have, just to remind, so we have two materials that want to violently react, okay? And we have the separator material, okay? And it's about, you know, it might be about one quarter of the thickness of a human hair, okay? So we have these two materials that really want to react, okay? And these materials are very close to each other, okay? <laughs> okay? That's what we're dealing with, okay? And it's through this careful, well-engineered engineering and scientific trick that we're actually keeping these materials from reacting, okay? And instead we're allowing them to react the storm. So just think about what's at stake. And we're also, by the way, asking for more and more power, right? More and more of these materials that want to violently react, okay? Um, and packed up close to each other, right? So the overheating one is, is, is rather more straightforward to explain, okay? So there's a safe temperature limit. We start off with some temperature. Um, and start off at initial time. And all of these processes that I talked about generate heat, okay? Because anytime you operate a process at a finite rate, you generate heat. So that reaction generates heat. The movement of the lithium ion inside the battery generates heat. The other reaction generates heat, okay? And so the cell temperature, the temperature inside the battery actually increases and actually the temperature rise becomes more extreme with higher power. When you're demanding high rate, okay? So a Usain Bolt level of rate, okay? then uh, you're going to increase the temperature more quickly. You're generating heat more quickly than you can dissipate it. Yeah. So in summary, so we have these two issues, right? The lithium ions don't move easily enough, okay? And the heat, uh, heat builds up and we have overheating, okay? Now there are some common approaches um, to this. Um, materials development, there's a lot of uh, good and, and uh, you know, value material efforts to actually develop a material, for instance, that will only let lithium ions through and not allow the anion to move the other way. So you can keep the, the concentrations level and avoid some of these issues. That's, a, uh, that's, a, that's an approach that's been underway. Um, unfortunately, that can have some challenges that um, it keeps the, 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 the other ion from moving through, but it doesn't allow lithium to move much easier, okay? So lithium, um, it keeps the concentrations uniform, but it has some resistance to actually allowing lithium to move through it. So that isn't a, it's, it's, uh, it's an approach and there's some good approaches underway, but it has its limitations. Um, there's some advanced electro design that actually opens up the space and allows the, 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 uh, the movement of lithium ions to happen a little bit easier, but again, it has its limits. It only works so well. As far as overheating, um, the other thing is that people do is they, they, they sort of use a fan. You can see, well, this laptop you know, has a fan that kicks on, right? So you can blow air around the battery system um, to actually cool it off. That's another approach that's used. Okay? Um, the issue is that the batteries in the center, first of all, it doesn't reach all the batteries that are in the center of a large battery pack, okay? Like, a, like an electric vehicle may have thousands of batteries, right? Okay, so you really need to actually have an inter, really intertwined cooling system to actually reach all those cells in the middle. And then even if you do reach them, the actually there's a temperature range within the battery itself, okay? They can happen as well. So thermal management systems have their limitations, okay? And especially when we're demanding, again, both of these issues get worse with high power and extended times of, of operating the battery, okay? So um, a new design, an operational approach that, we, that um, you know, and that's been applied to lithium batteries roughly in the past 10 years or so, um, is to take this lithium, this conventional closed battery system, has a liquid electrolyte in it, um, and open it up, so to speak. So actually allow for flow of this uh, liquid electrolyte across the battery, okay? And, Convection, where have we heard the word convection before? Convection ovens, right? Well, what do convection ovens do? Why do they, what, what, what's the advantage of convection ovens? Can someone tell me what the advantage of convection ovens is? As a fan, what is it, why is it, why is it better for, for cooking? What's good about it? <laughs> it was heat transfer, so we have, yeah, so engineers know the engineering answer. It allows your food, your, your food to get cooked more uniformly, right? Right? Instead of just getting heat from the bottom, right? <laughs> um, it allows your food to get cooked more uniformly, right? It spreads things out, makes things more uniform, right? Okay? So you have a system where things are actually, there are hot spots, there are, um, there are sort of temperature variations, uh, there are me, concentration variations. Convection would, would be a way to actually help, help level things out, okay? So we do some predictive modeling to look at this new convection battery. And so we add flow to, um, you know, to, to conventional um, you know, lithium ion battery uh, system. 
these are some of the governing equations and no, you know, no talk, no series of talks at MIT would be uh, complete without a partial differential equation in there. So it had to, this had to do it, sorry. Um, <laughs> but what this explains is that it's just that the governing transport equations just basically say that, you know, to accumulate, you accumulate something, okay? Okay, if you have a lot of generation of that material, either lithium ions or heat, okay? Subject to spreading, right? So you spread out things. Naturally, things will want to spread out, okay? Right? If I have a high concentration of something in the corner of this room, even in stagnant air, it'll actually gradually spread out. That's what this, these two, these two uh, terms are expressing, okay? So these are the equations of, of transport inside um, a lithium ion battery. There are a number of other equations that are not necessarily incredibly relevant here, but these are the ones that are relevant, okay? Most relevant here. And to these, for modifying for flow, uh, for modeling a convection battery and doing prediction, um, we actually add these convective terms, these flow terms, and you can see V for velocity in there, um, appearing in both the way that the lithium ions are moved, as well as the way that heat moves inside the system. Okay, so we just mathematically added this. And why would we want to do modeling? Well, early building of prototypes um, is tricky because you actually don't really know how much flow you need, and you actually don't necessarily know how to size the system. Okay, so it's really tricky. You cannot actually simply build your way, prototype your way into doing all the literally you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of, of, of uh, dimensions, uh, properties, um, and flow rates to actually decide what the best convection battery design. So it's really modeling simulation that enables the use of, enables the designs which will work effectively. Okay. So with this, what are some of the predictions? Okay. And there's some predicted improvements with the convection battery. This is a simulated case, and I'm talking about high power. So we think about that in that axis, right? High on the, on the vertical axis on that plot I showed earlier. Um, and just to give you a sense, this is actually for those, you know, the electrochemical folks, this is 5.7 C rate. Um, and to give a, I looked up and sort of got a, a common sense of what 5.7 C rate corresponds to. So think about, think about uh, these high performance, relatively high performance electric vehicles now. They can go from zero to 60 in amazing time four seconds, five seconds, six seconds. Okay, really, they're, they're actually faster at this point than, than, uh, than a gas, uh, you know, gas powered engines, okay? So think about flooring that, okay? And I looked up the C rate, estimated the C rate. So it's, this C rate corresponds to about what you would get by going from zero to say, you know, 60 in you know, five or so seconds, okay? That's sort of about the power demand, the, the rate of drain on the battery that you're actually getting, okay? This corresponds to about this rate. So very high power. Now imagine, that sort of max horsepower that you can look up, right? Imagine sustaining that as long as possible, right? Now in a real car, you can't do that because it actually turns down the horsepower when you get, when you get fast. But imagine you were sort of sustain that. You're flooring it, you're going as fast as possible for as long as possible, right? Accelerating as fast as possible for as long as possible, right? Because that's what this corresponds to. Another way to think about this, high, this, this C rate is to think about, um, it's about attempting to fast charge in under 12 minutes. Right, that's another way to think about it. If you wanted to, who would like to be able to fully charge a vehicle in under 12 minutes? Anyone? Okay, all right. <laughs> so that's what that's what this. So this is a kind of a torture test, right? Is basically what I'm getting. This is a real, it's a rather extreme test. Not the most extreme test out there in batteries, but it's a it's a it's a pretty stringent test. Okay. And so, um, so if we actually think about how a conventional battery would perform under this, um, we actually well I'll start with the middle axis. Okay. And a metal plot here. This is the cell temperature, and I and, and you know put it in degrees C. So you think this is you know this we have a cell that's actually say it's starting off at about you know room temperature. So it's a nice warm day, let's say you know it's starting off at a normal temperature. Okay, and if you floor this vehicle, right, the battery pack starts to heat up, right? Okay, and it actually heats up to the point where you actually can't get all of the energy out of the battery. It reaches the safe operating temperature. Okay, about less than halfway through the usable energy of the battery, okay? So you actually have to stop, okay, use of this system because it's getting too hot and it's reaching an unsafe temperature, okay? Now, at that point in time, when you've reached that point, let's see what's going on inside the battery. That's this plot here on the left, okay? This is lithium ion concentration and I've got the units here. Um, this is in molarity, this is in position inside the battery. Again, this is that negative carbon electrode, the separator, um, and then the positive uh, metal compound, metal oxide, metal phosphates, and so forth, okay? In this case, it's, uh, you know, it's this particular compound, so uh, cobalt oxide, okay? 
we see this excess of lithium ions in, in the negative electrode. We see this sort of starvation of lithium ions over here, um, which again, sort of you know, makes, the, makes this electrode have to work a lot harder. This positive electrode have to work a lot harder, generating heat, actually making the situation worse, okay? And you have to stop. You get less than half the energy out, okay? Now, what we actually discovered, the key discovery was that with just minuscule, and I'll emphasize, very small amounts of flow. This is 0.2 microns per second, okay? You begin to actually sort of help the situation. You shift some of the, some of the lithium ions, uh, lithium ion solution uh, over to the right. So the excess is actually shifted to the right where it's needed. And then you actually increase flow further. Um, and these are different increasing flow rates. As you see, as you move, as you increase the flow rate, as you get to just about one micron per second, okay? a flow across this battery, okay? You actually fully sort of quench. You can actually begin to quench the temperature rise, okay? Now, just to give an example of what one micron per second is, okay? If, you, if I hold my fingers one millimeter apart, right? <laughs> okay, one micron per second, and what does it take like 15 minutes for something to move, something moving one micron per second across uh, one millimeter? This is very minuscule amounts of flow. And that was a real key discovery that you have really minuscule movements or flow of, of, the, of the electrolyte inside the battery. This evens out the concentration, this sort of dramatically curbs the temperature rise. You can see that you do not have, no longer have a safety issue. You're able to actually fully, uh, you just simply increases the runtime of energy, okay? So you can actually put in actually the, or, or get out actually the full energy uh, of the battery. So this would be a situation, you know, you could think correspondingly, okay, you know, uh, you notice that for instance, when you actually charge, if you look at the fine print, if you charge a vehicle uh, very quickly, um, you might get, yeah, in 20 minutes, if 20 minutes fast charge, we might only get half, or you might get some fraction of the full energy um, into the battery, right? Whereas with this technology, this would actually, and some other, some other advances, you'd be able to actually do that and get the full charge in there. Now, the reason I mentioned this example of electric vehicles, okay, we have to think about adoption, okay? And I'll get to that in the, in the next slide. Um, we have to think about adoption, think about what would actually make this technology more usable, you know? But this substantially increases the runtime and energy, and this was a key discovery that, that we made with this. Um, so some benefits, again, overcoming the transport limitations that have been described would mean that we have significantly greater runtime and, and energy under high rate. And these would be benefits um, by either materials approaches that I've, that I've sort of alluded to, as well as this convective, uh, convection battery approach. It would help, it could help enable faster charging. Um, this would also reduce size and weight because remember, this is power per, per mass that we're actually up against, okay? So we're actually getting a lot more power out of a system of a particular mass, okay? And we're getting a lot more energy out of a system of a particular mass. So this really helps reduce the size and weight, which will be important for getting that thrust of, say, aircraft, um, the acceleration uphill, and those other, other benefits of, of using high power over sustained uh, amounts of time. This also could actually help with longer lifetime. One thing I didn't mention is that when, uh, that when you operate under these very aggressive situations, you build up a lot of temperature, that actually accelerates degradation. So you think about how long a battery lasts, um, you know that after a couple of years, right, your battery starts acting up, right? Um, and they, co coincidentally, it's very convenient, they, they set it so it acts up around the time they want you to buy a new phone, right? Okay, well, well, um, well actually by actually regulating the temperature in a more favorable way, you actually allow for a longer lifetime, okay? We simply cannot have batteries that we have to change every two years inside of our electric vehicles, okay? And we don't have that right now, but I'm saying the batteries that we have, we like to last, make them last as long as possible, okay? Um, safer operations, um, as we know that, you know, there, there are thermal issues with batteries, so we can have by the ability to have a throttle to actually quench um, the heat buildup um, and also for safer operations as well, okay? So, um, the key, the bottom line is to actually strive for broader adoption, okay? This will allow, this, this or, and other approaches, other great approaches going on, um, will allow for more applications, okay? We can allow for more applications in terms of storage in homes, storage in, in electric vehicles, and use in electric vehicles. More users, this needs to fit all lifestyles, okay? This, this sort of energy, electric chemical energy technologies and other clean energy technologies needs to fit all lifestyles. It needs to fit lifestyle that someone is, uh, is in a residential uh, arrangement where they live in the suburbs and they have, um, uh, they live in the suburbs and they have access to, you know, to plug in uh, charging in their garage or in their, um, or, you know, or so forth. And someone who has just street parking, right? Who isn't in a garage, right? Okay. They might need to charge more quickly. So those, those, uh, all the range of users, okay. 
And it's by getting more applications and more users that we can really reduce emissions, okay? Global emissions, okay? So um, the last little segment, and I see we're, we're running on time, but I'm almost wrapping up here, is combining mission and passion and sort of teaching for um, a, a talented, diverse, uh, you know, talented, diverse innovators um, and a talented, diverse workforce is another passion of mine as well. So, um, so this relates to the mission because as I mentioned, we'll have a, you know, we have a, this will affect, you know, 8 billion people and counting on the planet, right? That's, that's the reach we're trying to get with. And also, we look at the you look at the uh, the economic prosperity that's possible for um, you know using uh, clean energy technologies as a whole, not just batteries, but um, it's it's a it's an industry that's in the trillions. When you add up um, vehicles, uh, you know vehicles as an industry. When you add up uh, energy generation and storage as an industry, it's a trillions with a T um, as as far as its economic potential. And as we know, we do not have representation in, in, in black and brown people um, in, in, this, in this industry and in others as well. So teaching for a talented, diverse um, workforce is, is a passion of mine as well. Um, I relayed uh, one little story. Um, one of the discoveries about my passion was that um, in high school, there was a problem that uh, I was teaching. I was, it was a class, it was a problem that, that no one could solve. The teacher couldn't solve it. The other students couldn't solve it. Um, and so, but I solved this problem. And um, this is a story that many people, maybe other, you've had this experience. And so the teacher asked me to teach the class that day. So I taught the class. I thought the solution to the teacher and the other students, okay? And I realized, I was like, I like this, actually. I like, <laughs> I like addressing challenging problems and sharing it with others. And I like it when others do the same, right? Just challenges and same with me. So this sort of was an early sign, an early indicator of my passion for teaching. Um, my teaching philosophy is multifaceted. I want it to be accessible to different diverse uh, people, people of diverse backgrounds and diverse thinking styles as well. So we have some theory. Um, students who were, took my class will, will recognize this, uh, recognize some of these equations talking about how the reactions happen. Lab experimentation, hands-on work, okay? Hands-on working with systems. Computer simulation, actually running numerical simulations that solve those, those heinous partial differential equations for you, okay? And written and uh, written documentation and oral presentation. Um, you know, it's not about what uh, it, it, the the evidence that someone has learned something is not what I've shared with them or what a lecturer has shared with them. It's what they share back. That's it. That's evidence of what they've learned. Okay, what they share back. And so students, different parts of the of the of the class. You know, different students come, you know sort of come to life in different parts of the class. There's sort of something for everyone. Um, and also, it's reinforcing to have sort of learning and come in different directions. Okay. That's part of my, my, uh, my passion for teaching, yeah? So lastly, I'll just sort of wrap up um, and say, you know, well, what is the draw for battery? Why, are we, why, is, this, why is this charged time, okay? What is the draw for battery research and teaching? And for me, which maybe some of you can relate to, okay, it's the opportunity, need, and even responsibility to drastically reduce, reduce emissions, including carbon dioxide, okay, to better our planet. This demands, this calls for broader adoption. We have to have, we have sort of single digits and some people say double digit adoption of electric vehicles. We actually need broader adoption and it will take actually um, something that it, it exceeds a commercial state-of-the-art lithium-ion batteries. We need high power, we need high energy. We need the elite marathon runners of batteries, okay? Curiosity, understanding how battery works and what their limitations are. And then solution approaches, both the materials, uh, materials approaches that are going on, as well as engineering approaches, including this convection battery that I described. Our prediction and discovery was just that minuscule movements helps distribute lithium uh, ions uniformly and curves temperature rise. And this has significant, it can have, could have significant implications for power, energy, runtime, and safety. Um, and I touched upon the teaching, sort of teaching and education for diverse, talented uh, workforces, a passion of mine as well. So with that, I will, um, I will close out and thank uh, the host faculty member and, and uh, collaborator, um, uh, Fick, um, Sasha for, uh, for collaboration and uh, the Brushwick Group, um, some of whom here, the Provost Office for, for funding and, and, and supporting and sponsoring um, this program, uh, all of you in the audience um, and the students from the class who, uh, who showed up here and uh, I really appreciate uh, seeing you. It's great to see all of you again. Um, and the uh, caterer, of course, and, and our and uh, for providing food and and uh, you know uh, food for the food for the stomachs as well as for the minds. So um, thank all of you. Thank you so much, Javit. We have time for a few questions.
So um, while Divya and Molly are checking any questions via chat, um, I do want to open it up to the audience physically here. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll pass the mic to you. It could also be comments as well. It doesn't have to be a question. How about those joining us virtually? Any comments, questions? Yes. Um, thank you so much. My question is about how long do you think it will take before um, this field reaches the state that it needs to be like batteries are very complicated and difficult to optimize and you also need them to be extremely portable to sustain like the life we're leading towards. So like how long will it take and are there any alternatives while we wait, I guess? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, you know, how long will it take to reach broader adoption? And then so over there, um, you know, so uh, niche adoption is already there. I mean, you know, single digit to, to double digit adoption and say electric vehicles, so forth. I mean, that's, that's a dramatic change from, you know, from as, as we've all witnessed. Um, so niche adoption is there. Um, broader adoption, there are, there are many bets on this. <laughs> um, I think the, the, you know, the common feeling is that, well, this, or some other <laughs> batteries, when I say this, I mean batteries or some other clean energy technology, um, you know, kind of has to work. Otherwise <laughs> we, got, we got major issues, right, this, this century. I mean, um, certainly there are, you know, there are approaches in the pipeline for, um, you know, for continued uh, sort of incremental improvements in the next, you know, five, five and 10 years and smarter designs and so forth. Um, you know, beyond that is where things, where one of these sort of breakthroughs, and there are people working in material science and chemical engineering, one of these breakthroughs really has to, has to come through. And so, um, you know, there'll, there'll be, you know, I, I would anticipate continued improvements as, the, as, as some of the, um, you know, more modification type changes uh, come into effect in the next five to 10 years. Um, and that, you know, will I get adoptions in the, in the you know, in the, you know, in 30% range or higher? Okay, but the, but the real breakthroughs uh, it's still to be determined. I, I would say the, the I would say the verge still out on on you know will we get the the huge leaps, the substantial breakthroughs needed. Um, but there have been a, amazing. There's been some amazing progress, particularly in costs. Um, really amazing progress to sort of bring this to the to the forefront. Yeah. Thank you. Other thoughts or comments? Mm -hmm. Hello. All right. Uh, thank you for the. Great, uh, great presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is around uh, lithium um, and battery. Mm -hmm. So what is the next big update on lithium, uh, the current system? And then what is the uh, technology? What will be the technology behind the big update? What is, what is sort of a next yeah. big, big improvement? Yeah. Um, you know, that's so like current understanding, like or current hypothesis that, you know, that will be the big update. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I can talk about it in terms of the technical areas with just lith, let's say lithium ion batteries. And again, this, we are, you know, again, thinking about the broader field, there's lithium ion batteries, there's, there's electrolysis, there's, there's fuel cells, but lithium ion batteries, I mean, a couple of, you know, bigger, bigger things. There's, you know, there's certainly ways to address some of the transport limitations that I've talked about in the electrolyte. That's a big area of, of work. Um, I've talked about the engineering type approach here. Um, so that's a, that's an area that, that, you know, like I said, we're, we're collaborating and working on. Um, there are materials approaches to address that as well, okay? Um, that, you know, big breakthroughs in, in, you know, in sort of the transport limitations is one area that's, that's needed. Um, the other one is actually in the, uh, in, the, in the sort of active materials um, themselves. I haven't talked much about the solid materials that are actually host the lithium um, and so forth. So there's some, there's some breakthroughs needed there as well. So there's, um, in terms of in the graphite material, for instance, um, um, there is, a, there is a, a, a need to actually have the reaction happen more quickly and how the lithium 
actually diffuses inside the graphite particles. So there's, there's modifications that are needed in terms of the actual solid materials, let's put it that way, inside the batteries as well. Um, um, there's also need, needed in, in, that, in that sort of solid material transport. There's also needed improvements in the sort of energy content, let's put it that way, of, of the materials, right? So more potent fuels, let's say, if, if we think about it. So, you know, greater, you know, sort of watt hours per gram or, or amp hours per, per gram. So we need actually more potent sort of combinations of fuels, okay? Um, there's, work in, uh, there's work on this as well. You think about there's um, different materials other than graphite that people use. Um, there's uh, yeah, so, you know, silicon and other materials. So those are, those are, if I was to think of buckets, I would say the transport related issues that I've talked about here um, is actually solid, solid transport related issues. And then there's energy content um, related issues that, that, that sort of need to get, need to get addressed. Um, uh, if those three line up, you will definitely see substantial improvements, but which one or if they line up you know, is, is a big question. Yes. Thanks so much. A re really wonderful presentation. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, where is uh, geographically the, the lithium source from uh, on, on this planet and, or, and the other materials that are sort of uh, really key in terms of, of battery work and connected to that, it, it, are any of those locations where the materials are coming from, are they also developing technology? Are, are they also doing research? Yes, so um, great question, um, um, Louis Messiah. He's one of the, one of the MLK visiting, uh, visiting professors and scholar also. So um, this is definitely a big issue that I haven't, that I haven't particularly um, talked about. So this is, um, you know, some of the some of the, the lithium sourcing lithium is so it can be sourced from uh, from wa salt water it can be sourced from um, from different you know sources such as salt water. The um, I believe they're sourcing some of the students might be able to help me out. Uh, South America I know there's uh, sources there. Um, there's also sources in the U.S. Um, this is an issue. One of the issues is that the the uh, the elemental abundance of, of lithium um, you know poses globally right so poses challenges, right? So um, it's sort of like if you build the technology and it works, and then all of a sudden, all the vehicles are converted into, into uh, you know, lithium ion battery powered electric vehicles, then you have a crunch for the materials. Um, for that reason, um, some people are proposing to switch to, over time, to switch to sodium, uh, sodium ion batteries. There's a lot more sodium on the globe. It's, it's one of the elements that's above, you know, 200 ppm. Um, you know, in certain terms of at the surface of the Earth's crust and in in in, in, uh, in salt water, um, so some people are proposing the, the to shift to more abundant elements that can be that can be sourced. Um, on the other materials, the metal compounds, that's actually, I'd say, at least as much of a challenge actually, um, because um, cobalt that's currently used, um, there are some you know sort of ethical issues with how it's mined. Um, it's in limited sort of regions uh, throughout the globe. Uh, and so that's that's an issue. So people are having to change materials um, that are currently in our lithium ion batteries, shift from these to actually more abundant materials. Um, iron is one of the ones that's sort of favored as far as the metal compounds. Um, it's for, for its relative abundance. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat, which reads, are there additional barriers from applying this wonderful research to larger batteries that could power something like a car? For instance, is it more difficult to maintain a consistent flow rate through a larger battery set of batteries that could lead to uneven charging? Yeah, so is it, is it, is it, does it scale to something like a car? I, I would say this is, um, you, you might have to adjust the geometry of, of the way that current batteries are done uh, in order to do it. Um, um, and, it and it will be favorable for systems uh, for, for larger systems, okay? Um, currently there's a lot of actually, you know, uh, manifolding and, and sort of, you know, inside of a, a electric vehicle, a lot of manifolding to actually do a lot of cooling already, right? So the thermal management system that's inside of an uh, electric vehicle is quite substantial already, okay? So this will be a different thermal management system, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily more. So I, I would say this would be favorable. Again, what it will really take is a real application study, like a, a true, detailed application study 
on, on any particular technology. Um, but I would say scaling is, is, is an advantage of this. You would not really want to use this for something like, like this small, okay, like a, like, a, like a phone. It would be scaling for, for medium to large, large applications. So we're about time. Um, I just want to echo what um, one of our MLK scholars, Lou Masai, said that this is a wonderful presentation. For me, for someone part of the um, general audience, like something that seemingly was esoteric, you really brought it down to something that we could apply in our daily lives. So I really appreciate that, uh, how you presented. And also what kept coming to me um, during the presentation is you are really embodying MIT's mission. And I do want to repeat what the MIT mission is just because like the whole presentation that just kept coming to me. So the mission of MIT is to advance knowledge and educate students in science, technology, and other areas of scholarship that will best serve the nation and the world in the 21st century. So thank you so much. Like really your presentation embodied that whole thing. So something very relevant to us. So thank you so much. Um, we have Javid Drake here. He might, see, can you stay a little bit longer just for any other questions or comments? But thank you for joining us, uh, particularly those joining us virtually. We appreciate your engagement. Thanks for the comments and the chats in the chat function. And um, for those who are still here, we do have extra lunch boxes. So feel free to grab these lunch boxes and bring them to um, your respective areas. Um, and again, our next presenter, Louis Messiah, is presenting on April 5th, same location. Um, that's Wednesday, April 5th. Um, and again, if you um, want additional information, definitely sign up um, for our newsletter, ico.mit.edu. And thank you and have a good afternoon.